Hello and welcome to another episode of Red Station Station. I'm your host, Alan Wyma. Today, I'm with Tyler Mandry, who is the co-lead on the Async Working Group. It's great to have you on, Tyler. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Could be better. <laughs> but in any case, I think, you know, we were having such a good discussion before we start recording. I didn't want to waste your breath on revealing too much because the Async stuff is kind of like, kind of feel like it's clear, but also not clear. Like think that underneath the hood is, has no idea what's going on, but it's like a car, right? You don't know how the hell the engine works, but you know how to, you know, put into drive and park and all that kind of stuff. But then like now the question is that everybody has on their mind is like, what's the story with the ASIC runtimes? We can talk about that later on about, you know, why is it that I cannot just slap V6 into a V8 engine kind of car and this kind of stuff? I think we to talk about that, but also your work on doing that portability. But why don't we talk more about the Async Working Group? How long has that actually been around for? And what is the main focus of the Async Working Group? Yeah, so the Async Working Group is focused on what we call the the foundations of async rest so it's anything in the rest language itself or the standard library and then we also sort of help own sort of like quote unquote official futures rs create which is part of the rest language it has been around since before i've been involved in rust so you know i've definitely inherited it and fully on the the shoulders of other leaders in the community like taylor and, and yash and, and aaron and others but it has been around for a while, and you know, there, the working group was originally involved in stabilizing async await, and now we're taking sort of all the pieces that that were involved in that and trying to kind of round out the edges and, and fill in the missing pieces so that you can have things like portable libraries that work across executors and that sort of thing. Actually, I'm kind of curious because async to me is quite recent, right? Or that's what I was kind of curious about when this group was actually started up because I'm sure async was always something that people were thinking and talking about, but it's only really been stabilized kind of within the last, what, it's like the, the last release of Rust with the version, uh, what do they call that again? The 2018 edition, the edition of Rust. Yeah, 2018 edition. Before that, it was, you know, there was async Rust code. It was using futures and combinators so you get a future and you can map it you could do kind of like dot then that sort of thing which you see in other languages but it wasn't as deeply integrated into the language before the 2018 edition stabilized the dot await syntax now the 2021 edition make any changes to async in terms of how you use it no i don't believe we had any changes to async in particular for the 2021 edition it was a fairly small edition but there might be changes in future editions, so we'll see. I think we interviewed Mara Boss, and we didn't have the episode because we lost some audio from it. But I believe, I forgot who talked about that. I'm pretty sure it's her. Said actually 2021 was actually a much bigger edition than 2018, which I was a little bit surprised to hear about. But I think it's because lessons learned about how you're trying to you know, align an edition with a really big feature coming into Rust was just a disaster and a headache for everybody involved. So yeah, most exactly. people who did were in 2018 to 2021, it was like not the same people for the most part because it was such a pain. Yeah. And that was, you know, you can talk to a lot of people who are around then and they'll tell you the same thing. That was very kind of draining. But yeah, I think the 2021 edition more focused on like, here are kind of the set of small little breaking changes and tweaks that we need to make so that we can land more features in the future. And Mara is obviously the, the expert on that. But, and, and she did a great job with sort of shepherding that edition through and getting it launched. Yeah, I have to say that was an easy upgrade though. Not much real changes. I think just look out for a couple of maybe imports that you don't really need to import anymore was probably the biggest thing I think that most people probably run into certain things where it already included in the prelude. Yeah. And it's great that we have automated tooling just to migrate you from one edition to the next. I know we just ran it on Fuchsia and it, you know, it, was, it went, seems to have gone very smoothly. So that's really nice. And I really like that Rust has a story for um, sort of evolving with, without breaking stability, but not also not stagnating as a language. Speaking of Fuchsia, you're also on the Fuchsia team and within Google, right? I don't know how much we can talk about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So I work on the Fuchsia Rust team. Um, so I'm the, I'm the tech lead for that team, and, and we basically, our job is to make Rust kind of like the best language it can be for Fuchsia, which is an op open source general purpose operating system. And so, you know, we work on things like tooling integration, fixing things in the compiler, developing the language, 
like in ways that are helpful for us. Async, we use async all over the place. And so that's what our team does. I'm kind of curious about what's the point of Fuchsia if we already have like Android and Linux and Google has a couple of other different OSs. Like what's the kind of goal of Fuchsia comparison to the others? Yeah, I mean, I guess what I can say is Fuchsia is an operating system that's focused on being simple, secure, updatable, and performant. So these are like sort of the core tenets of Fuchsia. And I can't really talk about like long-term strategy. It's like way above my pay grade or anything like that. But I think it is an exciting project because it's really has you know security and isolation kind of built into the, the core primitives of the OS rather than kind of being introduced later, which I think is exciting. I think it's kind of very compatible with kind of like the mindset of Rust, which is like always be correct and secure first um, and then make sure you're performant and then make sure you're like as productive as, as you can be. How much Fuchsia is actually written in Rust? It must be quite a bit because that's really a core piece of it, right? Yeah, we have a lot of pieces of Fuchsia written in Rust. So probably the biggest piece that is not written in Rust is the kernel, the core kernel itself that's written in C++. I think if we had started Fuchsia a few years later, maybe it would be written in Rust. But we have a lot of low-level pieces of the operating system written in Rust, like file systems, and we have drivers. We have a network stack that's written in Rust, a Bluetooth stack. So kind of a lot of the fundamental pieces of what you think might be included in an operating system, those are all written in Rust. And so we use it quite a bit. I don't have up-to-date numbers off the top of my head for like number of lines of code or anything, but I believe it's in the millions, both like first-party code that we've written and, and third-party code that, that we use, like external crates and that sort of thing. Yeah, the interesting part about Fuchsia is that, yeah, I think that it's definitely one of the more mainstream ones. Mainstream OS is written in Rust. And the other thing too that also I know because I do a lot of Flutter is that there's already Flutter support for Fuchsia out of the box, which is interesting. So there's really a long-term use of Fuchsia, which I feel like Fuchsia is going to be going towards more embedded kind of systems. But I guess you cannot say too much. Yeah, you're shrugging, but that's fine. I'm not looking for an answer, but this is kind of my own take on it. And I think it's interesting. So I hope that I'm happy to see that there's a system that's using quite a bit of Rust within it. And that's going somewhere. So has actually releasing, just kind of one more last question about Fuchsia. Has the release of Nest with Fuchsia been a really good like proof of concept that using Rust is good or not or anything like that? Has that had any impact? Because like, I mean, it's one thing to play with it within a lab, within your desk, et cetera. But when it's actually out there to the mainstream people, like, you know, what has been kind of the feedback in terms of just usability? Yeah, I think the experience of using Rust has been really positive within Fuchsia. I can remember like one like engineering manager who told me the story that you know their team decided to write the component they were writing in Rust, and a few months into the the project, they were like, "Where are all the bugs?" Like, <laughs> you know, in the past when I've managed teams like this, like we had a lot more bugs that we had to deal with, and like kind of slow down development, and you kind of so down feature work to go fix the bugs. And like that just wasn't happening. And I think that's I think that's really a testament to the strength of Rust like type system and core primitives like ownership and borrowing that make it really easy to express invariants in your code. And that's obviously really important when you're writing an operating system, but also really important when you're writing a web service or whatever else people use Rust for, whether it's low-level systems programming or like, you know, just like some kind of like critical infrastructure in their stack. Well, it's good to hear. I mean, it seems exciting, but I guess let's see what the future has. Is you sure there's nothing else you could say? Is there anything else with future that's going to be coming out soon or you really cannot say at all? I'm just curious. I can't really say anything that hasn't come out yet. That's, to be honest, I don't really, I don't know. I really know a lot about that, but... Yeah, I mean, I, I can't say, you know, we do almost all of our development out in the open. And so you can go browse the source code. If you go to like Google open source code search or fuchsia.dev, you can download Fuchsia. You can check it out. You can build it. It will take a while. And there's also like a, a community to score that people can join and, and like talk to Fuchsia developers on. So I can't really share plans and like don't really know a whole lot about that, but I'm just happy to be working on like a cool new operating system that uses Rust heavily. I'm really happy to be able to like 
be a part of the Rust project and ecosystem is, is part of my job. So that's why I'm here and that's why I'm excited to be here. Yeah, definitely. And actually, I sorry to kind of ask one more question outside the async part. I think the Google team in general, so the Google, like, I can't really say Google team, right? It's Google company. But within Google, they are actually pushing Rust throughout. And I think also within Android itself, right? Because of the safety guarantees that they're like, okay, this old stuff, yeah. we're not going to rewrite, but the new stuff is still buggy. We're going to actually start to rewrite that stuff in Rust so it can be safe and it can be you know, all those guarantees that Rust gives you, right? In terms of like not only safe, but also concurrent and not deadlock, et cetera, like that. So mm-hmm. are you aware of this kind of stuff happening? Or I mean, are these teams coming to you guys and saying, wow, you know, we're looking at doing this, you know, how does it work with Fuchsia, et cetera? You have these kind of conversations also? Yeah, definitely. The Android team is really embracing Rust and very happy to see that. And of course, I've talked with a lot of those folks within Google. Yeah, I think like there have been a couple blog posts like on the Google security blog about how Android uses Rust and like the promise that they see in it. So yeah, and you obviously see it being picked up across the industry too, not just Google, but lots of different companies, Microsoft, Amazon, many, many companies that you may or may not have heard of before. So it's pretty encouraging to be a part of and to see what I know when I was, you know, before working here, when I was working in C++ mainly, I saw, I was actually working on asynchronous code in C++ and, you know, saw kind of the foundational posts about futures in Rust and like kind of the high level code that you can write that just all gets compiled down to kind of the low level code that I was writing in C++. It's all equivalent, but it was just much, much easier to think and reason about. And of course, today we've gone a big step beyond that, even with async await just being integrated into the language. And so I remember being really kind of jealous of Rust and thinking, wow, like I'm spending all of this time, you know, tracking down seg faults and things like that on our team and great if we could just use Rust. And so it's kind of been almost a surreal experience, just like seeing and feeling that promise and then like getting to go like use it and experience and kind of seeing everyone else starting to come along for the ride. It's been really fun and cool to see. Now, I'm kind of curious too. These ASIC runtimes, some of them can work with core Rust because, I mean, when you're working with Fuchsia and all these other things, you need to actually work with core, right? You cannot work with standard because those actually require an OS underneath it, I think, right? Yeah. So if you were implementing, if you're implementing a kernel in Rust, say, yeah, you probably would not be able to use the full standard library. You would want to work, yeah, you just want to use core. Most code, most Fuchsia code is able to use the standard library because it's really just kind of written as an application or like a process running on top of the OS. So code is a little weird in that, like, yeah, we're kind of like resource constrained, like you might think of as being kind of low level, almost embedded code, but we do have full access to the standard library, which is nice. So, but there are executors that are sort of designed for those use cases where you don't necessarily have like an allocator or <laughs> certainly full access to the standard library. And so, and that's another reason that you want to be able to support multiple executors within async Rust. Cause I mean, we just have a really wide variety of use cases. Rust was really kind of ambitious in this regard. Like most languages, you know, if they have async support, they will kind of bake in a runtime and that tends to work really well for whatever, you know, sort of, family of use cases that language is designed for. But with Rust, we really wanted to just bake in kind of the core primitives that you would use and then allow people to write their own executors that were geared for different use cases. And so that's how you get to the state of, okay, well, we have a a core future trait and we have async functions and dot await syntax kind of built into the language. There's not much else. Really, we want to get to a place where you can write, like, you can write a library like, say, Hyper. It's kind of, Hyper is an implementation of HTTP written in async Rust. And it's really kind of like a middleware layer. It's like, it's designed to be kind of like a low level thing that does a really good job at implementing the HTTP protocol. But then you, know, you might use a library on top of that, like request or something, something else to actually drive it and like just have a nice, easy to use HTTP client. So I think 
we're very close. Well, actually, so Hyper today can be used on any executor. And I would like to get to a point where we can use all kinds of different libraries across uh, different executors and make it easier to use language libraries like Hyper across different executors. So I kind of see it as being like concentric circles. So today there's really not that many libraries that you can use on any executor. A lot of them kind of bake in support for for Tokyo or like one of the other common runtimes. And it's because we haven't really stabilized like the core abstractions that are necessary just to be portable. So, you know, one of those is just the basics of what any executor can do, like spawning a new task, maybe starting a timer. And then you've got, you know, the ability, you want the ability to kind of plug one component into another, like maybe, you know, on one end of your protocol implementation, you've got like a socket that's provided by your executor. And on the other end, you've got like some other higher level protocol implementation. And so that's where you need like async read and write traits, that sort of thing. And we have a couple different versions of that in the ecosystem. I really need to like standardize on one so that like Oliver can just work together. And then after that, uh, eventually I'd like to make it so that you can just have code that can open a socket or like maybe even do like file IO asynchronously without knowing actually what runtime is running underneath it. So I'm talking about when I say like concentric circles of like, yeah, middleware type stuff is, is the easiest and we want to make that really easy to port. But then, you know, as we like stabilize more abstractions and like figure out kind of the set of all use cases that we want to be able to support and like what the different constraints are, we can sort of stabilize on like the core abstractions that enable all of those use cases and then have code that doesn't care what executor it's running on, runtime environments, and it's just, you know, very generic and easy to use with like whatever use case you happen to have. That brings us to a really a core question that I always have is like, why is it that these async runtimes are not compatible with each other? Like, I just want to use something that asynchronous. Why is it that I need to decide on one? I know I can have more than one async runtime, but I mean, usually you'd want to only choose one. Of course, Tokyo is the default, right? And so it's like, why is it that there's support for Tokyo and nearly everything, but like there's some of the other ones, it's like no support. I have to build that myself. What's the story that things are so kind of fragmented in the runtime case? Yeah, I think the first thing is that we need those like core abstractions so that it's just easy by default to make your code you know, portable across any runtime. And yeah, I think the state of things today is that because we don't have those abstractions, like library authors have to kind of choose how to funnel their energy. And I mean, this is totally reasonable, especially if you're maintaining some kind of open source library. It's really hard to write eight different versions of your code for eight different async runtimes. And so we need those core abstractions so that you can express what you need to express without, instead of calling, you know, Tokyo spawn, you call, you accept some executor trait and then you call executor spawn. And we have like a standard API for that. So when we first stabilized Rust async await, we only got kind of the bare bone core abstractions that you can use to literally just write async code, but we didn't get all of this other stuff that you need for like kind of the broader health of the ecosystem and having the kind of reusability of code that you would expect from from a language like Rust. Okay, so it's really a, an issue of kind of defining more abstractions that people need to kind of rally behind, right? So is the working group actually reaching out to the popular ASIC runtimes and trying to figure out where we can make some very useful abstractions based on how their runtimes work? Yeah, so we're kind of tackling this from a few different angles. So like like Nick Cameron, for instance, has been driving the overall portability effort and uh, like he's been working on async IO traits recently, you know, has been doing a great job, like figuring out different use cases and different angles that people are coming from and, and kind of trying to, to accommodate all of those. And then we're also, and that involves like talking with not just runtime maintainers, but also people who are deploying those runtimes in production environments, people who are, have like really weird and different use cases, like maybe writing an operating system, for instance. 
And then we're also working with people from representing like a few different runtimes as we're thinking about kind of new language features that we'd like to introduce that just make it easier or maybe less error prone to write async code. So like a big one of those is, for instance, async functions and traits. And we're also looking like, how can we make dispatch work with async functions? And so we kind of have like a, a little, like a stake, stakeholder group where we basically pitch our ideas and then <laughs> let people like ask questions and attack them and say, actually, this doesn't work for my use case at all. And I think that's been really helpful as part of the design process. So I'm very happy to have people who <laughs> have a lot more experience than I do with actually using these features in production. Has there ever been some suggestions by the working group that the community just said, no, that's the most worst idea I've ever heard? Or is it, have you guys, I know it's always good intention, right? Just kind of curious about how close is, because the thing is, there's always this idea about academia is not always in line with practicality or, or usefulness, right? So, yeah. you know, I mean, obviously with you working on Fuchsia, you have some more usefulness, but it's constrained to what you're working on, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, every human has limited time and attention and certainly no different. I am not one of the people who's like really in the weeds, like writing, like implementing Bluetooth in Rust using async or anything like that. So yeah, you really have to rely on the experience of other people. And <laughs> yeah, as for other suggestions that people have said, that's the worst idea I've ever heard, definitely. And, you know, it may not come as a surprise to people who are kind of familiar with the Rust community and RFC process that some people look at an idea and say it's the worst thing I've ever heard. Other people think it's the best thing I've ever seen. You definitely have like a wide variety of uh, different takes on that. But I think even though that does make progress like a little bit slow and halting and frustrating at times, I think the the outcomes of that are overall much better. And this is my first time kind of funneling a set of features and ideas and hopes and dreams through this design process. And I guess we'll see what comes out at the other end, but like fairly optimistic because I think everyone who is involved, you know, either in, in the working group or like representing the different runtimes, what have you, I think everyone like wants the same thing, which is for us to be as broadly useful and productive and like enjoyable to use as well as being performant. And so we all kind of have the same goal. It's just like, we have to really hammer out all the different perspectives on how to get there. How do you handle feedback where you have two different ends saying, this is really good or this is really horrible? How do you choose what's the best one? I guess you have to look to see what people like and what they don't like and see if you can somehow make those two meet, right? Yeah, I mean, it can be a challenge. You know, I think probably the first thing to do in a situation like that is to say, okay, well, if you think this is horrible, like what, what specifically don't you like about it? Like what, like in many cases, people are kind of having like a visceral reaction to something and it's very like a natural thing. Like if you, if you look at something and you just know like deep down that like you've written code but before, like have some use case where like this is just absolutely would not work for that. Often it, it really kind of manifests as like an emotional reaction. And then you kind of have to like inspect, okay, what's actually the specific thing that you're responding to? and when you start to pick that apart, I think it becomes a little bit easier to to understand what the different, like where the value is in that reaction, right? And I think like almost always there is like some very useful feedback embedded in that, but it might be much more narrowly scoped than like it seems at first. And so that's how in the ideal case, you can find something that's really actually compatible with what everyone wants. And you can get people to kind of be explicit about kind of what their constraints are, like what specifically they want to see or don't want to see, you know, it becomes a lot easier, but definitely not always the case that you can just do this and everything's hunky dory. Like our fundamental disagreements about like the values that we want to preserve in rest. Like, do we want to preserve the value that rest is easy to use for new beginners or do you want to preserve the value that Rust makes everything very explicit and it's impossible to miss any kind of like like hidden slowness? Like these things are often intention, 
And that's where it does just become difficult. And like sometimes someone just has to make a decision or we don't make a decision and, and the feature never gets shipped, right? And that's honestly like the case with a lot of features in Rust is that we haven't found the way to do them how we really want. So we just kind of wait and they kind of languish, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it is a trade-off that we have to make. What is like the number one and most important issue that the working group is working on at, at the moment? I think we're working on a number of different things in parallel, and I don't want to like put anyone's work on a pedestal or minimize anyone else's work. But I can talk about like the high level areas that we're working on right now. So I'm working on like core language figures like async functions and traits, just kind of like rounding out the set of features that you might want to use async with dynamic dispatch. And I've been happy to work on that with like Nico, who's like way more knowledgeable about core language features and, and design than I am. We're also working on portability, like we talked about before. There is an initiative for tooling, so stuff like Tokyo Console, as well as like debugging crash dumps. You know, we, we really like the ability to look at a crash dump or like open up something in your debugger and like see the state of all your async tasks at once. So that's kind of like inspectability and like having more insight into how your, your async code actually behaves. And then there's there's polish, which is just that's an area that I think we needed to improve on. So you know maybe if I were to pick one, it might be polish. I think there's just a general sense and a true one that when you use async, everything is a little bit harder in Rust, and that comes everything from like the error messages from the compiler just aren't as good to yeah they're just like really kind of missing pieces in the language to. Actually, the compiler is giving you an error, but like it could accept your code. Like your code isn't actually wrong. It's just the compiler isn't like well developed enough to know that it's not wrong. <laughs> and so like that's a big area. And like everyone in the working group has been kind of pitching in on this, in addition to kind of, like the big areas that they own. So like we have seen progress, a lot of progress actually, over the past few months. And but we're going to continue pushing on that because I really want. The experience of using async rest to be you know every bit as enjoyable as using regular rest without async and we have a ways to go but i think we're not too far off at least as far as like the compiler error messages and stuff like that go yeah so one of the things i find kind of interesting a little bit strange is the idea that rust within the language itself will provide all this stuff for async but at the same time they don't want to provide a runtime for async so it's kind of like, okay, you're giving me the wheels to a car, but where the hell's the engine? You know, it's literally, that's basically what it is. And right, right. it's like, if you look at every other language out there, they, I mean, I think most languages out there, they, they give you the engine, but actually you only have one engine as opposed to Rust where you can choose the engine that works best for you, the runtime that works best for you, which I think is a definite positive. But at the same time, like for beginners, I mean, I think that would just automatically throw them apart. Like, wait, whoa, 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 I'm writing this program. I can do async stuff, but then actually I can't. And I have to choose one. I don't know which one to choose. Yeah. And pretty much everybody online just says, well, just go to Tokyo unless you have a good reason not to. And <laughs> I think that's fine to rally around a single runtime. But I think the main issue is like, well, that's going to possibly throw some people, right, to say, okay, well, this seems like a really bad idea for a language. This, yeah. this is basically going to never, ever be a kind of preferred or an included runtime just for something so that way we can kind of have like a more complete language, right? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think there are definitely a lot of, this is an example of something where there are a lot of kind of like strong opinions and like not necessarily agreements over whether we should have some kind of included runtime in Rust one day. But I will say like, we definitely want to retain the ability to to write, to bring your own runtime. I think that's just a very important aspect of async and Rust because I've, the use cases for async are like very kind of wide and varied as they are for Rust in general. And generally when you're using async and Rust, you have like some kind of pretty performance critical use case in some way, but it could be performance critical in a completely different sense than another person's use case is performance critical. critical. So Definitely want to be able to bring your own runtime. The out of the box experience is not great. And I totally agree with you on this. It's very hard today to just get started writing code in async Rust. 
certainly if you haven't chosen a runtime and I wouldn't expect someone who's just interested in, oh, I kind of want to learn async rest to know anything about choosing a runtime or anything like that. So I completely agree with you that the experience is not good in that way today. And you can think of ways to improve it. Right now we're focused on figuring out what like the core set of language features that we want to expand is going to look like. And once we have that mapped out a little bit more, I'd really like to focus on getting our documentation into a state where it's very approachable and kind of guides you from a place of not knowing much about async, but wanting to kind of play around to like to actually getting some code up and running pretty quickly. Then maybe introducing you to kind of like the more advanced concepts that underlie async rest. So right now it's kind of a smattering of, of different things in different places. And so I think that's really important. That's a really important aspect of like the polish of the overall experience of using it. The other thing I want to ask a question too is async to me, and I think when I read about it, it's usually always talking about IO, right? But that's not necessarily true, right? Because async can also be about CPU bound tests, right? Yep. Yeah, it absolutely can. So I believe Glomio is an example of an executor that's designed for this use case. And it has like a completely different execution model than something like Tokyo, which uses work stealing. And Glomio, like every async task that you spawn runs on one core and one core only. And kind of the whole runtime is architected around this idea of you have one thread per core and like you own, you know, you, the person running this code, like owns the entire box and all the CPU, like all the CPU cores. So you're just going to pin every core and like try to execute hundred percent as much as you want. And so like, that's a very different model than something where you need like high concurrency, but you're handing things off to the operating system back and forth using ePool or something like that. And like you have this work stealing model and other runtimes that, and that like changes the APIs that you would use for like spawning, for instance. So, I mean, this is a great example of how you can just have very, very different uh, use cases that you want to support with kind of the same underlying language primitives, language primitives, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's also really hard to kind of keep track about the different types of ASIC runtimes because there is so many different kinds, right? And it just depends upon what you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, there's a number of projects that are kind of like of varying sizes. And I think that's kind of the case with Rust crates in general, right? Like, you know, you want something to, I don't know, pad your numbers or something. And, and so you go like and create said, I oh, maybe there's like three or five different crates that do like similar overlapping, but not quite the same things. It's kind of a similar story with async. Although like I would say there's much more kind of it's probably a shorter list if you look at just like numbers of downloads, it'll, it'll probably fall off relatively quickly. But yeah, I think we should be pointing people either in a direction of here's a great runtime to get started with, or we have some kind of like toy runtime that's useful for getting started and kind of getting to learn async out of the box, but isn't also isn't the thing that you would use actually in production. And then like once you actually want to productionize something, you go and kind of like pick your runtime. But I want to get to a point where the code that you wrote when you're just learning is the same code that you run once you've picked a runtime. You just need to change you know, one or two lines. And so that's another thing that we're working on for, for portability. I think another big issue is that not everything that can or should be async is actually async, right? And so when you start writing code that some is an async, some is synchronous, you have this thing called the async sandwich, right? which mm. is quite interesting. So the reason that we're talking is because we had uh, Zishan Ali helped us to kind of get connected. Sadly, he couldn't make it because he's a little bit ill. Just kind of wanted to put that out to everybody to thank you for hooking us up together. But kind of going back, this was his question, and I think it's a great question to ask, which is like, is the async working group looking at this kind of issue where you have this async, sync, then async kind of issue? Or, you know, how the hell do we handle this? I know within Tokyo, they have actually something where you can turn something that's synchronous into async. It's like mm -hmm. spawn sync or something like that. I forgot the name of the function call. Is this also something that you guys are looking at? Yeah, definitely. Right. So Tokyo has this like spawn blocking primitive and a number of other uh, runtimes also support this. Yeah. So you often will run into situations, maybe I shouldn't say often, but there are definitely, it comes up 
where you'll run into a situation where you you have some synchronous code and you can't change the fact that it's synchronous. So you have like some function, maybe in a trait that you need to implement and you're calling it from an async function and suddenly you find yourself needing to call into an async function. The function in between is synchronous and it has to be synchronous. So you have this issue of, okay, now what do I do? I need to like, you know, some people call this like the infamous function coloring problem and, you know, get very uh, worked up about it. But, you know, it is an actual problem because now you've like kind of lost the fact that you're being called from an asynchronous context and you need to kind of get back into one. So, you know, some runtimes support, almost all runtimes have like a block on method that you use from a synchronous context and you pass it like a future uh, and then you just like synchronously block until that future is done. But it can get really tricky if you're trying to call this from within an async task that the executor is already running. Now suddenly you've got like this recursive thing where the executor is running an async task and now you want to ask the executor to run this other async task and not give up control, you know, not return up the call stack until that's done. And, you know, different executors have different levels of support for this. It's almost never really what you want to do. Like, executors can support it. And I think they could be, like, a little bit more forgiving about that. But you always kind of be in the situation where you've lost the ability to execute concurrently when you're, like, inside of a block on. So, like... For instance, when you're writing async code, you know, you have the ability to spawn a bunch of, create a bunch of other futures and then kind of join them, which is like waiting for all of them to complete. And then you can do something with all the results. There's another primitive called select, which is you, know, you basically work, wait for the first of a list of futures to complete. And like all of these basically stop working if you call into some blocking code, like block on. So it's almost never the thing that you want to be doing, but sometimes you just kind of get into a tight spot where there's not much you can do about it. So I think we can support this better. I think we could, you know, sort of give users like more of a, maybe a degraded experience. Maybe like you get like a warning or something saying, hey, this is probably doesn't do what you want, but like I'll make it work this time. But, you know, just be on the lookout that it could like degrade performance or something like that. So that's one thing that we can do without making any like big changes to the language or the standard library or like introducing any new features. But there are also like other sort of more galaxy brain stuff that we thought about. Like, what if every regular function could be either synchronous or asynchronous? And it's like, it's asynchronous if you're calling it from an async context and it's synchronous otherwise. And as you can imagine, this sort of brings up a whole lot of other interesting design questions and challenges to work through. But it is something that we're looking into because I think it also can just make the overall experience of using async a lot better if you don't have to juggle around like multiple versions of every type and every function and every trait depending on whether you're using async or sync so that's something we're looking into yeah because i do know that like tokyo and stuff they have their own versions of certain libraries because of some other reasons but i think one also is because yeah everything within standard library is not asynchronous right there's no i don't think there's anything in the standard library that's actually asynchronous is that right there's not really any APIs in the standard library that are asynchronous. There's the future trait and some like helpers to go with that and like the low level primitives that enable the future trait. And that's really about it. So yeah, we certainly don't have like an async file system or socket API or anything like that. And a big reason for that is because that is usually quite tightly coupled with the executor runtime that you're using. So you could envision a world where we allow you to bring your own executor, but also use like these standard APIs kind of on top of it. I think I'd like for us to get there, but uh, yeah, we're not there yet. Yeah. For the async part, right? So you kind of got into async. So you said you start working in async in C++ and then how did you go from C++ over to Rust and still stay within asynchronous code? <laughs> yeah, I guess it's kind of an interesting story. Or maybe it's not all that interesting, but yeah, I guess I kind of got fed up with working on C++ and I kind of want to do something different. And so I got involved in the Rust project kind of just on my own time. I actually got involved through the, the trades working group and I just kind of like showed up to a meeting on Zulip and 
didn't really know anything, but like there were some interesting docs I could read online and I just like to find something easy that I could contribute. And so that's how I got involved in Rust generally. And then, yeah, I had followed along with all the async stuff, which was kind of in heavy design discussion at that time. And then in 2018, I went to RustConf and like I met all these people that I had, you know, either heard of or worked with in the Rust project. And it was just like, it was a great time. And I met a bunch of people who, you know, work on my current team on Fuchsia and, you know, kind of got a few introductions and you know, ended up, you know, long story short, ended up interviewing and getting a job months later. So, you know, I was really work looking for a place where I could, as part of my job, work on Rust itself stream. And I was just incredibly lucky. I think I had very good timing or, you know, what have you to get a job where I could actually do that. And so, yeah, I think like the async part is, well, it's because, you know, I was paying attention to async at the time and like Fuchsia happened to be one of the big users or the users of async and people like Taylor Kramer were involved in, in that early core design. And so, you know, that's kind of where I was looking. And then, you know, I ended up finding a bunch of people who I could talk to at RustConf that year. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So it seems like you can use your contributions as a way to kind of get out of the C++ C world into a much better Rust world now. <laughs> Yeah, possibly. I guess that's how I did it. But, you know, everyone's path is, you know, it's going to be different. But yeah, I was lucky and like privileged enough to have like, I guess, sort of the hits for to like just show up and not really know what I was doing, but, you know, ask for a way to help anyways. And so my friend Jane Leslie just wrote an article about imposter syndrome. And I, I found that it, it really did resonate a lot because I think there are times when I felt like I really couldn't contribute because I just like, I didn't know enough and I was lucky enough in like this one case to just kind of force myself in the door. But I think like there's a lot of other people and there's a lot of other times in my life when I've kind of held back because I didn't, I just didn't know everything that, that I needed to or that I thought I did. And, you know, it turns out that like you can learn and you actually probably know more than you think you do and other people probably know less than you think they know and so like if you're determined you can make real contributions and like maybe you're lucky and that that turns out to get you somewhere that you wanted to be that you aren't now but yeah i think it's one thing i love about the rust project and like the larger rust community that it's a part of is that it's very it's not only supportive but it's like very committed to fostering like a welcoming community not just welcoming but like accepting and like a place where you do not feel threatened or like made fun of for like being different or like not knowing as much as everyone else and i think that's actually a huge like it's almost a rest language feature right like we have like some really smart people involved in the rest project that weren't here like a few years ago, right? And a lot of those people probably wouldn't have, like a lot of those people actually like may have tried to contribute to other open source projects. And I've heard a lot of stories like this, but then like they ended up in like kind of this like toxic culture. They didn't really feel comfortable. And like in Rust, for Rust, they didn't really have that experience. So I think it's a huge asset for Rust that like not only that we have this code of conduct and like care about it and like enforce it, but that it's just kind of like ingrained in the minds of all the people involved in the community. And so like that was a huge deal for me. Like even coming from a place of like having like a lot of privilege and like ability to just like I knew a lot about C plus plus or like systems programming or, or what have you, but I didn't know that much and I felt much more comfortable where there is like an actual call for participation and hey you can just come to our meetings like we'll try and find something for you to do um, so that was huge for me so you know if you're interested in getting involved in this project or contributing like just take that step and and like show up somewhere like ask to be you know ask to help 
and just see if like there's something that you can contribute to. And it can be like really small things, but small things do kind of add up over time and you learn as you go. So, Yeah, especially like it's weird because there's a job for everybody, right? I know there's some people who are interested in tech. They don't like programming. They do like writing. So then actually documentation is actually something that I think documentation is the one thing that every programmer wants and needs, but nearly every programmer doesn't want to do because it's just so <laughs> painful and hard to keep up to date. Yeah, it's true that I think everyone complains about the docs not being very good. And I think, I mean, honestly, Rust has comparatively good docs, but boy, they could be better. And yeah, I think beginner's mind is such an asset when you're writing documentation. So like, that's a case where actually you not knowing everything is an advantage compared to everyone else. Because like, when you're understanding a concept for the first time, that's almost like the best time to explain it to somebody else. So yeah, I mean, documentation is, if that's something that, that you're drawn to or like contribute to, I think that's yeah, absolutely a good place to get involved. But it doesn't have to be documentation. Like there are a number of, of places where you can plug in and like just to pick one, I know that like Clippy, the Rust Launcher has a very... They put a lot of effort into like their onboarding experience for new developers and like have a very like smooth, uh, at least strive, at least from what I've heard, have like a very kind of smooth certain path for new contributors to follow. So like you don't have to know a whole lot about compiler design or writing to be able to successfully write a Clippy lens. Like it might take a little bit of time and learning, but like you should be able to do it. And so there are a number of areas like that. I know, you know, I mentioned uh, my friend Jane earlier. She also has something called Awesome Rust Mentors that has like a list of people who are in the project and like willing and able and happy to help mentor people who want to get involved. So I'll also plug that. I'm just kind of curious, somebody who's working in, in the async and working in a lot of different stuff, is do you feel your code writing or your documentation writing, you feel more worried about if somebody goes to review it? <laughs> Do I feel more worried about my code or my documentation? That's an interesting question. Well, I guess. Which one do you feel more comfortable with when people give you critique on? I guess I can answer in that way. Yeah, it's a great question. I guess with the code, you can run it and see that it works. With the docs, not so much, right? Like you could easily have a, like taking like a mental shortcut, don't realize that you're taking or versus like grammatical errors and stuff that like people don't check, but or sorry, that <laughs> the computer doesn't always check for you. So I don't know. I think it's probably easier to get the docs wrong, but like there's definitely things with code, like style and like kind of just like the way you're expressing it that that can be a challenge too. So I would say probably my docs are probably less good than my code. I would definitely say that. Unfortunately, it's something we can all improve on, I'm sure. Yeah, I think all of us especially native speakers like us, we're not very good at writing papers unless you're, of course, you're an academic. I find yeah. foreigners are much easier and much better at writing papers. They study grammar much more than, than I think we ever did in school. Interesting. Yeah, I could see that. That's what I usually find. But actually, because I'm living in Hong Kong, I always get like brought all these English work and say, can you tell me, is this okay? And I'm like, man, English is my worst subject in school, actually, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, it's like, uh, it sounds right, I think. Not sure. I couldn't yeah, tell you I mean, whether I should say good or well. I forget the rule. Yeah, I can definitely say it. I transcribe a lot of my sort of verbal habits when I'm speaking into text sometimes, and it doesn't always translate very well. So I'm glad people put up with, with that in chat and stuff. Yeah, but I think when you're communicating across to people from all over the world, right, you find Writing is much more complicated, right? Even in messages, because you have to make sure you clearly say everything and you have to say it in a way that is non-colloquial and you try to think about the culture of the person who's receiving the message also too. Yeah, especially true if you're writing some kind of like, you know, something like a blog post or, you know, or something that has kind of like a finality about it, right? I mean, if you're in a chat room and you can like kind of double back and explain yourself, that's one thing. But yeah, I do find that to be, you know, writing an RFC or like some kind of design proposal or something like that, I do find that to be a lot more intimidating because, you know, I, I really like, I'm kind of a perfectionist when it comes to writing things like that, which is probably why I don't do it very often. But yeah, I'll find myself writing or reading what I've written, you know, 20 times before I publish it or probably 
writing something and reading it like three or five times and then rewriting it and kind of go through this whole process. And yeah, you're right. I mean, you do have to read it from a bunch of different angles and perspectives. And yeah, it's it's tough. Yeah, especially when you're like, you know, used to saying, hey, guys, it's like, oh, I can't say that because we may have females in the audience. OK, let me. Hey, folks. Hey, people. Well, maybe they don't think there are people. I don't know. <laughs> like you got to think about all this different stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's it's tricky, right? And writing is not easy. You're making me feel nervous already. Because I feel stressed right now thinking about writing because it's not easy. <laughs> I'd rather write code than write something in English in a format, especially documentation. You may get the wrong thing wrong. Like you yeah. said, the audience may not understand everything. It's so tricky. Yeah, it can be difficult. And it helps when you have someone that you can trust that you can have, like read an early draft or something and give you feedback on that. I find that to be really helpful for just like I guess in a sense like calming the nerves and just knowing that like oh a few people have read over this and, and think it's like generally reasonable or told me the ways it isn't so that's always like a big thing for me before I publish something is I like to have someone else at least look at it. So you can set up for reasonable or adequate you wouldn't want to keep going for something great or fantastic? Of course I want it to be great and fantastic but <laughs> I think there's like a level of like, oh, I don't want to publish something that's really bad in any way. And like, if it's not actually that good, like, oh, I don't know, you didn't lose a whole lot. But if you publish something that people just hate, like, <laughs> I don't know, you know, you start getting blamed on Twitter or something. I, I definitely don't want to be in that situation. So you kind of want to control like the downside. You could never have anything like that happen. You know what they say, right? Any news is good news. <laughs> is it the <laughs> From what I remember, I think in the past, people were particularly giving bad service to people so that people would blog about them and how bad they are, and they would just increase their SEO and actually make more money. I remember something like this. Right. It, makes, it reminds me of the thing, any publicity is good publicity or whatever. That's exactly where I got it from. I think it should be any news is, is good news. So as long as you're staying in the headlines, then people think about you, and that's what you need, right? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I really want to be a, a public figure in that sense. I'm more than content with, you know, kind of doing my own little, uh, my own little technical thing and, you know, publishing what I'm working on. But personally, I don't like the idea of having people talk about me all the time. Maybe that just is like fears and insecurities or whatever. But I like to publish stuff that I've worked on that I think is like important and good. And so, um, yeah, that's what I tend to focus on. But I don't publish very often, so maybe there's something I need to listen to in that. What you said. Yeah, but some, a little bit of drama can bring some more excitement and fresh blood to the working group, right? That is true. That is true. You could always have more drama. I'm not sure if that's desirable, but uh, you're right that well, it If you want to retire from the working group, you can do a bad job, and then people will come rallying and say, I, I'm running an election. I want to get, a, get go against this comment, this uh, Tyler Mandry guy. Sorry. No, no. Get him out of this thing. And then you can retire and say, ah, oh, finally, my plan worked. I can bow out gracefully. <laughs> yeah, I hope I'm able to do that one day without getting too many people angry at me. I think uh, I certainly don't want to be a leader of a working group forever. I think that's it's good to have people kind of come and go and, and make space for others. And you know, I'm here because someone did that for me. And I would like, I'd love to do that for somebody else. And, you know, people you know, kind of like, do something else for a change and, and kind of keep things exciting in that way. Hopefully I don't have to uh, get someone really mad at me in order to do that, but I'm sure that'll happen anyway. That's good to hear. Okay. I think we've already used quite a bit of your time and appreciate hearing from you and hearing what's going on with the async working group. Is there anything else you want to say before we sign off? Uh, no, I think this was, this is really good and fun. Thanks, Alan. This is really fun to talk about. And, you know, it's my, I think my first time doing something like this. So, You've been a great host and kind of guiding me through this. Yeah, I guess I would say if you are interested in getting involved in the REST project, um, in the working group in particular, or just sort of in general, you know, I'd love it if you could reach out to me or definitely reach out to me or, or just show up and, and zool up in one of our meetings or something like that. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter or GitHub or, or wherever. It's just Team Andrew. But yeah, I definitely encourage anyone who's who's interested in doing that to uh, yeah just go do something and find a way to contribute. 
yeah, otherwise, I don't want to take up too much of your time. So really thank you for this opportunity. I think it's been great to talk to you and uh, hope it was helpful for people. Yeah, I'm glad that we could find a time because it's tricky with us being in different time zones. So, but no. And also, you're a very busy guy, right? You're like, oh, I'm still busy too. And then you're like, yesterday was like 2.30 in the morning for me. I'm like, well, forget that. I'm not going to stay awake. <laughs> as much as I really want you to come on, uh, no, I'd rather yeah. have some rest. <laughs> yeah, no, I had no idea. Sorry. <laughs> totally fine. I understand. People never think about us poor people. Poor, uh, and I want to say poor, it sounds like they have no money, but us pitiful people in the other side of the world. Yeah, I actually had no idea where you were looking for this call, but... I guess I'll have to be more cognizant about asking that in the future. Oh, so you're not very inclusive of us. Oh, no. It's okay. Yeah. Used to it. <laughs> it's okay. No worries. Yeah, it should be better. Usually that. most people are in the U.S. Or, or Europe, so I understand. Well, I'm glad we were able to do this. Uh, that we found Definitely. Us. And now you're my contact within Google. So when I want to get a job at Google, I'll be, I'll be pestering you. And say, oh, look, I joined the working group. Come on, man. Give me a shot. I want to be a part of Fuchsia. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, we'll do. Again, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks for telling us whatever you can about you know what you're working on, Fuchsia and work in the async working group. And yeah, maybe maybe when we start to stabilize some more stuff, it'd be good to have you back on to talk about the long road of making things more portable because I think that's a discussion that everybody wants to hear about and why did it take so long and all these other things. I'm sure people are getting a little frustrated at. But yeah, until then, thanks again. Yeah.